Hello Ian, thank you very much for coming to my home today and to have a discussion with me about music, composition mainly, but um, it's so nice to see you after all these years of it being apart. Yes, it's been a long again. time. Yes, well thank you very much. So I'd just like to start the conversation with um, composition and the ideas behind composition mm -hmm. and everything um, in your own experience. Um, so when it comes to your work, when you come to composing new things, where do musical inspiration come come from, from for you in particular? Well, most of the stuff that I write is vocal, it's mainly for choirs, um, sometimes for solo voice. So the text would be a big inspiration for me. Um, when I was at school, I, I became acquainted with two Latin texts. Not that, I, not that I'm a Latin scholar, it was purely purely from a, a musical point of view that I, I think one of the first choral concerts I went to hear was the Verdi Requiem. Uh, and for a slightly different reason, I, I became familiar with the Rossini Starbuck Martyr. So I know the text of the Requiem very well. I must be a very strange child, 14 year olds. So I think I could repeat, <laughs> repeat <laughs> the Latin mass for the dead. Um, and I had grandiose ideas as, uh, when I just started doing O-level music of writing big requiems. And I had, still have at home somewhere sheets and sheets of manuscript paper that I ruled up um, to do requiem in G minor or whatever for vast orchestras. And I would feel, rule five or six pages of manuscript paper up and put titles on, write the instruments page down and then not know what to do. Um, but um, words really are the inspiration. I think um, they'll set a mood for me. Um, they'll suggest melodies and they will suggest rhythms and that sort of thing. Um, I recently did a setting of the um, creed, you know what I mean, the, the, uh, in Latin, with interspersed texts of Hildegard of Bingen uh, at various points during the piece and even before I'd started it I kind of knew what I wanted it to sound like but without any specific notes in mind. I wanted it to start off with um, a distant soprano solo voice doing um, a very plain song-like melody and very gentle and then the start of the creed to be a sudden blast of brass a big um, exultory beginning and I knew that at the end I wanted there to be a fugue and in the middle um, at the bit referring to the crucifixion I wanted uh, some very dramatic unpleasant sounding music so but I didn't actually know what the notes were at that stage. Um, and once I have a plan like that, I sort of kind of adhere to it for quite a while and then find it doesn't exactly work out as I intended. For example, this business that I mentioned that I'd like the piece to begin quietly with a soprano solo voice. I did start it like that. Uh, and it does have that feature in it. But I felt it needed something else once I, once I really got into it. So there's a, there's a passage that goes before that for choir as well. So I can change plans mm. it, it, uh, as I get going, you know. Um, if I write a, an instrumental or an orchestral piece, um, I find that harder. Um, so if somebody said, would I write a piece for flute and piano, as I did once quite a long while ago, there'd be nothing, I, nothing at all. Nothing would be in my mind at all. I would have no idea what to do. And, um, and I have to think of a different approach entirely when I do that. Um, I would say maybe a slightly more intellectual approach. It sounds a bit arrogant to say intellectual, I suppose, but I need something to hang the notes on to, and there's no text there. Um, some composers, 
find words or an encumbrance, they get in the way. Some composers, like me, find their help, you know. Um, and when I did do uh, this flute piece many years ago, I, I used a, a an early Renaissance compositional device called Isorhythm. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with Isorhythm. Is it okay just to explain it for listeners who don't know what well, Isorhythm is? Well, yes, um, as much as I can remember it. Um, it. Basically, it's a repeating rhythmic pattern, um, often combined with a repeating melodic pattern. It can be as it can be as simple as just six or eight notes uh, with a, a prescribed pitch, um, and um, but you can have them where the the rhythmic um, repeating pattern is a different length from the repeating pattern of notes. So, without turning this into a maths lecture, if you if you had nine notes in your melody and six six rhythmic values in your rhythm you'd need to repeat the rhythm three times to match with two repetitions of, of the melody um, uh, so it at least it gives you a kind of a structure uh, and you can work it out a little bit you can probably do sort of fascinating things like um, doubling the rhythmic values at, at a certain point uh, halving them and that kind of thing and you, you can get you can get a very nice pattern on a page with no notes just to say oh this looks nice and interesting uh but it, it I, and i i kind of took that as a starting point um i didn't quite have a repeating uh, melody i had a repeating period of time i wouldn't call it a repeating rhythm so that say after after 15 beats there was a particular chord came in and then, after another 15 beats, I repeat that same chord. Then maybe I did it 30 beats and, and so on like that. Uh, and I find that that pattern was something I could then hang the notes on. And it's interesting that, that melodically and harmonically, um, the piece that I then wrote is very much in the same idiom as, uh, as the, something I might have written with texts. So that would be my first starting point. The second starting point that I would use, particularly for a choral piece, is um, who I'm writing it for. Um, so that would give me an idea of the level of difficulty. Um, what sort of an audience is going to be there? Um, if you write a choral work, um, it's very like, it's, especially if it's a big choir, it's very likely that um, the audience is just going to be friends of the family. They're not people from miles away coming, oh, that looks interesting, we'll go to that concert. They're going because they've been coerced, probably. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, they're not probably not going to hear my piece. They're probably going to hear the, the piece that they know well. Um, so another um, thing that I often think about in, when I'm writing a piece is certainly in terms of orchestration, what pieces are there that have got the same orchestration that I want to use? Or more specifically, I'll look at some things and I'll base my orchestration on that. I did a, a piece um, 10, year, maybe 15 years ago now, um, and the commission was to write a piece that used the same orchestration that Handel wrote for his coronation anthems, uh, which is three trumpets, two oboes, bassoon, strings, um, percussion, and a keyboard player, continuo. So I use that plus one extra percussion. Um, so that makes it available for um, anything really that Handel has written. You could pair it with people will come and hear Handel because they know what Handel sounds like. Um, but if you're getting a new piece, particularly with some new pieces being a bit on the edge, uh, you know, it can put audiences off sometimes. Right. So is it kind of like more efficiency and economic purposes, just to yeah. pair it with Handel? Yes. Uh, well, yes, I mean, that combination worked very well for Handel. Um, and um, 
it's I think it's it's quite a challenge to see if you can come up with something that sounds new but using those forces. Hmm. And um so for the choral works, you know, the text is sort of like the skeleton of the music. Mm. For, so you have the text and you hang musical muscles on and yeah. other fibers and stuff. And for the instrumental, it's the rhythm. It's the sort of the overall structure. Would that be a fair summarization of... Well, well, it, well it, was, it was the flute piece that I just mentioned. But, but I, I, I was going to say I've got any number of tricks to get myself going if I'm doing an instrumental piece. Um, it could be anything from uh, a ground bass, like Purcell would do, you know. Uh, um, even even if ultimately I remove the ground bass, it, but it might get my get me going on something, you know. I'm just working on a um, a piano piece at the moment, a set of variations for the piano. Now that's that's not so bad because if you, if you do a set of variations, at least, you, at least you've got the theme, yeah. uh, um, and. Uh, I'm not using my own theme. Uh, I, I, do you know the La Arme Armée tune? I don't know. I won't give a rendition, <laughs> now, but uh, it's, a, it's a very well-known um, medieval melody um, that uh, lots of Renaissance composers used as the basis for for settings of the mass, as it happens, it, so that you would get this... Um, secular song tune um, running in the tenor part throughout the whole mass and composers would weave their counterpoint and harmony around that. Um, there's a very well-known modern setting by Carl Jenkins, he of Adiemus fame, um, called the Armed Man Mass, which has brought it, made it a bit more familiar nowadays. Um, but I've known it for a long time and um, I wrote a piece for recorder orchestra using it as a basis for a set of variations. Then I've done a, a, an, orchest an orchestral suite based on it as well. I thought I'd give it another go um, for piano. So variation for me is, is quite a, something I quite enjoy. That's quite a, a nice challenge to mm. see what you can get out of the melody. Um, on another occasion, I, I wrote uh, a concerto for two flutes and strings, which I think, um, if memory serves me right, in the same concert that you played uh, a movement from the Mozart uh, That's correct, yeah. double piano concerto, I think a couple of students at college played it. Um, and that was another piece that I had a bit of trouble getting going. And I decided that I'd see if it was possible to write a piece using Schoenberg 12-tone technique, but getting it to sound like Vivaldi. <laughs> uh, which, Interesting combo. <laughs> which I didn't, I, I didn't, I, I didn't really fulfill. But what I did do was I worked out four chords and those four chords each had three notes in and um, those, so those four chords, each with three notes, it did have all 12 notes of the chromatic scale with no note, which is, the, which is just a slight um, echo, I suppose, of Schoenberg's 12 tone technique. But I don't, I don't use that, um, that compositional principle. I just got these four chords. So I based the whole piece on these four chords. And so I used one of the chords as, as a kind of a tonic chord, another one as a, as a dominant chord, one as a subdominant chord, and, and there was one which was slightly different in sound to the others. The other, the other three chords had all got semitonal clashes in them, but one of them didn't have any semitones in it. It was B flat, E flat, and F. So it, it had a slightly different sound to the others. So, so I used that one to, I wouldn't say modulate, but, but to try, I used that when I wanted to transpose these initial chords to a different set of pitches. Yeah. Um, and I, I worked out a ritonello, just like a Vivaldi concerto, using these chords palindromically. I had the first chord, 
the last quote of the written letter was the same, and then the next one in from each end was the same, and so on. Uh, and it arrived in the middle on the most dissonant chord. And then I had all sorts of palindromic ideas going through the whole piece. Um, and I followed it rigidly, absolutely rigidly. And of course, it was dreadful um, <clears throat> because I sort of, sort of, I got it that I couldn't deviate from this chord plan. There were places where I thought, yeah, it doesn't sound quite right, but I was determined to keep these, these chords in this order. So um, when I, did, I left it, I put it away for a while, and I came back to it, and I sort of, not sanitised it, I sort of humanised it, I think, a bit. You know, <laughs> I thought, well, it just, it, I don't have to use those chords all the time. I can put another chord in if I want. I'm writing it. Yeah. There's no rules here. <laughs> yeah. you know, so I did that. Fantastic. Um, for a beginner composer student, for someone who hasn't really composed much, do you think that it's better for them to compose how they feel rather than being too to the book, too theoretical? So just, you know, following the rules too much and then that inhibits their ideas or do you reckon it's better for composition students to um, just to compose how they feel regardless of the musical rules? What, what do you think is the best approach? Well, you can only, you can only compose to rules if you know them. Um, right. um, and if you don't know the rules, um, you can't break them, can you? Well, I suppose you can break them, but you don't know you're breaking them. Um, the way composition is taught now, um, or the way it was taught when I, had, when I did it as a lecturing at a college, um, students were coming who, by and large, had no theoretical, not a lot of theoretical background, you know, um, sort of in this, say, harmony, that kind of thing. And they were just sort of thrown into it, really. Um, so, very often, uh, you get two sorts of student, really, possibly three. Those that have no idea. Um, those that really wanted to compose and had a gift for it. Um, and I think relatively few of those, really. Uh, and then a group in the middle which were quite interested in having a go at doing it, um, but again, didn't really know where to start. Um, I think even, even those students who were not amazingly good, they could always come up with some sort of idea. The problem is then, I think, they didn't want to do next, so they would then try to come up with another idea. Like a totally different idea to the first idea that they had? Yeah, just something else. What can I do next? Uh -huh. um, and then something else. So, so the whole thing could become a slog. One of the things I tried to do um, with whatever a student had come up with was to see the possibilities of it. What, don't try and think of something else to do. What can you do with what you've already come up with? Um, and one of the exercises that I used to use, and given the time constraints of the course and uh, the requirements to get something done by a particular time, you didn't have a long time to spend doing exercises. You just had to get on with the actual thing. Um, but you could spend three or four weeks at the start of a, a year, I think, um, doing little exercises, uh, one of which was just give three or four notes. Use these three or four pitches only and see what you come up with these three or four pitches. Uh, and give it a rhythm. See if you can write 15 or 20 bars of music just using these pictures and make it interesting um, and I, I demonstrate what I, with one that I've done so you can take these ideas and develop them any way you want um, and very occasionally people would come up with an idea and think I should oh, I think I could make something that and it would actually go into whatever they were doing uh, so that was one element 
Um, another, another thing that I would find is that, that students, particularly those who maybe had more of an aptitude, um, you would see um, with what they come up with, what they're actually trying to achieve, um, certainly in terms of what you might call um, a technical device like a suspension or something like that, that it would all be set up wrong. Um, and, and I often thought to myself, you know, if you'd have had some training in this a lot earlier, um, in the way that maybe I did when I, when I was at, at school, we, we did fairly intensive harmony lessons in years 10 and 11, so that with no composition, composition wasn't in, uh, getting to doing A-level music, it was more of the same but more difficult still no composition, just wasn't uh, part of the thing at all. Um, but, so that when I started trying to write my own pieces, I did have some sort of background of, of the kind of thing that works. Um, and unfortunately, just because of the way the exams have changed, that, that you get people starting doing A-level composition uh, and they've done GCSE composition, but even that's been sort of, well, without any background, they may know where the keys are on the piano and that sort of thing, and worked it out using Sibelius, uh, which is a great aid, I have to say, mm. you know, for anybody. I mm. find it very useful. But do you think the students these days are not having a strong enough foundation in musical theory to be able to compose and sort of realise their ideas effectively? Um, yeah, it's, it sounds like um, it's, it's very easy to say of course well, the exam was better when I was at home but right. I'm not actually saying that mm -hmm. uh, some of it was better some of it wasn't but I, I do think that the harmony training was really good all, all those rules that I learnt um, the, the most obvious one probably being that, that how important a really strong bass line is um, how good it is if the bass line doesn't go continuing in the same direction as the melody. Um, that, that works. You see that Bach has fantastic bass lines. Nobody writing a piece of music now needs to write a bass line like Bach, but, but, the, but the, the principle that a strong bass line often working uh, in the opposite direction of the melody is still a good thing to do. You don't have to do it all the time. Mm. But knowing that, know, knowing how dissonance works, um, how it's most effective, um, occasionally you do want to leap to dissonances. You don't, you don't have to prepare dissonances in the way that Bach would have done. But, but on other occasions you can need to do that. Um, certainly, if you're, if you're writing for amateur singers, um, you you don't want to write something that's so difficult that they're never going to be able to do it. And setting up dissonance is one of, one of the things. Um, I did in, when I used to conduct Porson for Baroque Choir, I did a Christmas carol competition once in various, for local composers. Christmas concerts were always done on about three rehearsals. And, um, one composition came in and the organ introduction ended on a cluster of notes and the choir came in on another cluster of notes, none of which were in the chord the organ had just finished. And if you'd have had um, a professional choir, they'd probably have done it. But I could have spent three, or three weeks rehearsing that opening chord, <laughs> and we, we never got it right. Um, so, if you're certainly the, these rules that you use that the earlier composers had, knowing about them is a good thing. Um, and I'm sure that, that they must be taught. I do know that they are taught uh, now when students go to university. Um, so. It, uh, it all seems a little bit later, 
but but of course by then people have already people with a real talent for composition have already started. I mean, some people will work it out for themselves, uh, but others, you know, I think so. This would have been so much easier if mm. you'd have known about this or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know, going back to composing for choirs and maybe orchestral pieces, what I found quite difficult, especially with um, as the number of instruments start to inflate, you know, there's more and more people in and more different voices doing different things. I, you know, during my bachelor's, I did something quite ambitious. I tried to compose a symphony with no experience whatsoever mm. in composing. It was just crazy to even try, but I thought I'd give it a go anyway. And the thing I found incredibly difficult was to compose so many different voices doing many different things. But despite doing different things, each voice within the context of different instruments, they still made sense. And I found that incredibly difficult mm. to make it all come together as a logical whole, musical whole. And I thought, is that something, you know, when you compose bigger ensembles, is that something you, a difficulty that you come across, you know, trying to make sure that everything, even though they're doing different things, they're st they still make sense in, in, the, in the aggregate, in the whole. Is that something you come across as well when you compose big ensembles? Uh... I'll just go back to, to the student thing just yes. for a moment. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see why I say it. One of the things that I would always say is don't use too many instruments. <laughs> you know, I wish someone told me that just earlier. Just because Sibelius <laughs> will put, uh, give you an A3 template for a 20th century orchestra, which has got gongs and tam tams and yeah. triple woodwind, and put, you don't have to do that because you won't be able, you, A, you won't be able to see it all on the screen. Yeah. And you'll never know what to give all these instruments to do. Yeah. Um, I think that from what you've just said, um, had you had any lessons in orchestration? No, never. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, there you are then. Um, and I, I don't think I did either. But um, I, I sort of, I didn't start by writing. Um, things for huge orchestras. I mean, a lot of stuff that I wrote a long, long time ago, there was no orchestra at all. It was either just voices or, or piano or organ or something like that. Um, but you do, do I, well, I, I didn't think I would go for writing something for a large symphony orchestra. Um, and it's only moderately recently that I've done standalone pieces for orchestra. Um, there are fabulous books on orchestration. Um, Is it okay if you can just give some idea of what the titles are? The yes, books? I yeah. can. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the best, in many respects, is old fashioned. Uh, is I, I can't remember the exact title, but it's got the word orchestration, <laughs> not surprisingly. <laughs> but, it's, but it's by Gordon Jacob. Mm. Um, and it's a fairly small book, but what is good about it is that he goes through it section of the orchestra by section. So the initial thing is just strings. He starts off with just writing for strings. And he covers things um, <clears throat> such as uh, what, what double stops work and what double stops don't work and that kind of thing. Um, and how how spacing of string chords work and that sort of thing. And he then will take an example, he'll take a piano piece and he, he does it and he will orchestrate it for strings. Say, this is how you should, this is how I would do this. So there's a really good example. Um, then he deals with the small orchestra. So he's got the strings, but he, he adds woodwind, I think single woodwind. So he gradually builds up to a larger orchestra. Um, and um, says things like, if you want the melody to come out in a very loud passage, give it to these instruments. And that's, uh, these instrumental combinations work really well. Um, uh, so shows you which instruments to double. So for example, when you said you've got all these instruments, uh, I suspect you were probably trying to give every instrument something different to do. As I recall, probably, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah well, yeah. well, you don't. It, right. That that just becomes so cluttered, mm -hmm. um, unless you want that effect. Um, <laughs> no, I wasn't going for that. But um, uh, on a on a different tack, when I when I I, I do music editing, um, and looking the operatic work that I I, I transcribed Donizetti or Rossini and the like, who are great orchestrators in, in their in their particular area. Um, they're using a fairly standard orchestra, strings, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, um, and uh, let me see, four horns, two trumpets, three trombones. In the very loud passages where they're all playing, they're not all doing something different. Um, flutes um, uh, and oboes may be doing the same thing in a different octave, or if the flute sorry, if the oboes are doing something in thirds, the flutes may be doing the same thing, but in sixths, so the intervals would turn round, the clarinets will be doubling that. Um, the bass line, you'll have the bassoon doing the bass line with the cellos and double basses, so very rarely are the cellos and double basses doing something different mm -hmm. anyway. Um, when you come to more modern works, if you, if you look at um, contemporary stuff, even there, you this doubling, you, you, it, it just becomes too complex. Um, you, you look at a, who was a great orchestra, Ravel or, or Richard Strauss. And Richard Strauss wrote some huge orchestras, but a lot of the stuff is is doubling right. at the time. Right. Yeah. That's what gives it the full effect. Yeah, so, and then, you, then you, can, you can vary by contrasting. You don't have all the instruments going all the time. That's the other thing that people have to use everything all the time. No, we right. don't. Um, I I remember editing, well, not editing, but I transcribed a Meyer beer opera. And um, it's a, I think, four or five act opera. <clears throat> and he used four, four bassoons and plus contra bassoons. And in the middle, there are 26 bars in the middle of this huge opera. The only 26 bars where the contrabassoon plays. It didn't play anywhere else. So we're talking about eight, no, not even eight minutes. We're talking about three minutes in this three hour extravaganza. And I, do, and I thought, oh, well, probably one of the other bassoons will they'll just play contrabassoon at this moment. But no. In that particular one, all four contra bassoons are playing, and they're all playing something different. Sorry, right. all four bassoons are playing something different. So, so you do have to get an extra player in just to do this bit. But players often have quite long periods where they're not playing. You don't, you don't have to get, keep them going every three minutes or something. Right, not have to keep them busy all the time. No, no, no. Right. Is there a, a composition that you're in awe of? You know, you just don't know how the composer managed to do that. Is there a composer? in mind for you i think for me it's rackman love symphony i've just I, I look at the score and i just i figured you know how does someone compose this yeah um well benjamin britain um in some respects i don't like everything benjamin wrote but um he seems to achieve the most remarkable effects by means that are so simple sometimes. You, you can listen to a piece of his and you think, my God, what's that? And then you go and look at the score and it's a C major chord or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's all to do with what's gone before it, what's gone after it, the way he spaces it, and the way, the way he scores it. Astonishing, really. Yes, I, I'm always impressed by his orchestrations and that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in the pieces you think, gosh, I wish I had written that. Right. But, but not everything that he wrote. Um, the other, uh, Leonard Bernstein, um, a completely different kettle of fish, really. But uh, he he comes up with, seems to be able to write in any genre at all, you know, musicals, West Side Story, but then you'll write symphonies, um, choral works. Hmm. Is there a particular composition that, you know, you like of him? Oh, yeah, um, well, I, the Chichester songs mm -hmm. very much, and um, 
I've been listening to Candide recently. And it's sensationally good. I really like it a lot. Um, I don't I don't know whether you describe it I don't know, as a music or an opera or what it is, <laughs> but it um, but it's got immediate appeal. Mm. Um, but it, it it strikes me as so fresh. Um, being able to do I mean, if you're writing a musical, you can't go off into realms of atonalism or, or, or really uh, un, un, unusual byways of modern music. You've got to stick to something that, that, uh, that an audience... But he seems to be able to do that. And, it, and you're thinking to yourself, this is, this is strongly tonal, but it, it, it's like nobody's ever written... It, it's so, so original within that genre, within what is basically not a complex harmonic scheme, I don't know, does it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find, yeah, the best composers are the ones that leave you baffled at, at how they manage to achieve mm. those things. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Leonard Bernstein. Um, it's a good transition to what I want to ask you next. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his Young People's Concert Lectures on Oh, he did yes, in the I, 60s, yes, I, I think. Yes, I, yeah. I think in the first actual lecture he did was that he was re-evaluating for the young young, um, young people the term classical music, okay. the umbrella term classical music. And he said that, you know, it wasn't, a fi- it wasn't sufficient to describe the whole genre. So what he said and proposed was that it's more like exact music. That's what it, classical music is, is exact music. Are you talking about here classical music in music from the classical period or just as a as an umbrella term so oh, sure. for the whole for the anything whole anything, you, think, yeah. the anything scene, yeah. you would consider classical music that leonard bernstein proposed that it's more like exact music so the here you have a here you have a manuscript and you have many instructions you know crescendo here mezzo forte here staccato here and you have to follow it and i just wanted to know what your opinion on that was you know ex- have having it called exact music um, well, that's, that sounds a bit like, um, is that removing interpretation from it? Hmm. Um, and is it exact? Uh, I mean, Baroque music wasn't exact. Um, if you we're talking of considering Baroque classical in the sense of, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you... If you think about, um, we'll, we'll, we'll take a Baroque opera aria, a dark harpo aria. Um, what's written for the orchestra would be um, what you'd expect the composer would be expecting. Um, the vocal line would be what he was expecting. But on the dark harpo, he would be expecting the singer to improvise on it, so you would be getting notes then that the composer didn't write. Um, within a fairly, I think they had sort of ideas of what worked and what didn't, you know, so uh, the best singers came up with solutions that the composer probably liked quite a lot. Right, right. Uh, but then, then you've, got the, you've got the continuo player hmm. playing. Uh, now, uh, if you get modern opera, operatic editions of Baroque operas, the continuo part's probably written out, but but at the time, um, the continuo player would only have the bass line and the numbers. Yes. Uh, uh, so he, it, what he played in the right time would be made up kind of on the spare of the moment. Hmm. Uh, and so that might be different every time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, there's an element of freedom there. Hmm. Um, so, as I think, um, as you move away from the Baroque period, um, it composers became more conscious of maybe their own worth, I don't know, or uh, took more care of what they were writing. I, I, just going back to the Baroque things, very, very often short in dynamics. Hmm. Um, it, it, often no dynamics. And any dynamics they got is just by adding more instruments or taking instruments away. I think they call it terrace dynamics. 
Um, yes. Mozart. Um, you, uh, I think a little bit of ornamentation in Mozart operas. Uh, uh, the keyboard was dropping out. I think a bit. Uh, you you wouldn't um, you wouldn't start tinkering too much with Mozart. I wouldn't think. Um, Beethoven. Um, the interesting thing about Beethoven, of course, is he used to write metronome marks on. Uh, I can't remember from which point he's, he wrote metronome marks on. But there's a lot of speculation. I, I can't remember the specifics. I'm <laughs> not a great expert on Beethoven's metronome marks, but um, they've been, some of them have been variously described as impossible. I, I, um, I don't know, and I don't know what, which one that is. Um, but, um, you know, if you listen to modern performances, they've got these metronome marks that Beethoven wrote. How many modern interpretations are dear to them? To some of them quicker, slower, whatever. Uh, I don't, perhaps, perhaps he meant that the, the basic material is, um, is um, exact. You know, um, it, it's there. You you can't go around changing it dramatically. Where um, I suppose if you listen to a pot singer sing something, uh, by rumor, I have to say, in my case, I, uh, um, I I have heard this and then looked at the. At somebody written down what they were saying, it, it's very free. Uh, and then somebody else comes along and does another recording and it's, it's, it's quite different again in all sorts of ways. You know, I know they do these cover albums and things like that. Um, yeah. And so, you know, sometimes you, you have to listen very carefully. You realise you're listening to the same piece. Hmm. Uh, somebody who's a bit of a crossover between the two, um, Gershwin, um, you know, I think he he no, he notated his music pretty meticulously, but you only need to think of something like "Summertime" from uh, Porgy and Bess. There are so many different versions of that, uh, you know, so far away from whatever he wrote, arrangements and and even supposedly straight performances of it, uh, hmm. with. Jazz singers doing it, opera singers doing it. Um, yes. Arrangements for piano and goodness knows what. That's that's very true. I think with um, pop music, the the there's there's more freedom. Yeah, I think when people do covers of pop songs, they they have the chance to well not chance but they normally replace words in the original song to fit it into their own context and yeah. to make it more personalized. Yeah. But that's something you can't really do in. In classical music, yeah, well, actually, and now, now, having, now having said that, I'd just, you know, undermine your own argument. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just remember, I know that, I know that in Baroque operas, um, the singer uh, would very often um, turn up with um, an aria that they particularly liked and said, I'll, I'll be singing this in your opera. Uh, and they'd have to find somewhere for it to go. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're showstoppers kind of thing. Yep. They, um, and, um, and by Rossini's time, um, he would um, adapt his operas if it was being performed somewhere. Um, he was in the habit of writing for specific singers, you know, so he would write to what they could do. Hmm. Um, well, if the opera was being done a couple of years later somewhere else, that singer might not be available. You know, and the singer would say, I, I, I can't do that, you know, <laughs> um, or it's a bit too hard for me. Mm. Um, so he transpose it, or he, or he would write another one. Yeah. Um, or um, you see, what, what else could they do? He would change it a little bit, or something mm. like that. Mm. Yeah. Well, this, is, this conversation is transitioning very, very smoothly. Now, I'm glad you mentioned um, tailoring compositions to particular people. Um, I recently read an article by, it was an interview with BBC Magazine. And um, there was an interview with a violist called Lawrence Power. And he said that 
the only way for you know fledgling talented young composers to make a mark in the industry is to collaborate with famous musician soloists and to commission pieces for that soloist to take on tour and i thought that was a a good idea and i don't really see that nowadays you know um you know i'll take pianists for example very famous pianist there's not many examples where i can see that happening you know they're collaborating with contemporary composers and taking their music on tour do you reckon that's a good idea to to do that uh, anything that promotes new music is a good idea i think mm. um i don't see why that shouldn't be the case yeah. um there was a a i think the trumpeter in was Alison Balkan, yes. but, but I might be wrong on that, but it was certainly a female trumpeter going with um, an English orchestra and a Chinese composer had written a trumpet concerto, I think it was Chinese, and um, he was, he kept rewriting it. Um, so I think either he kept rewriting before the first performance and she was trying to do the learners from memory or, or mm -hmm. something. And he, I mean, really last minute changes. <laughs> um, and there's a television series about it. I, I can't remember what it was called, but I remember watching this. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the basic idea of, of going around uh, with new compositions is good. And I think uh, that happens quite a lot with, with choral uh, compositions. Um, the the sixteen, do you know the it's a choral group. Um, they they started off specialising with Renaissance music, um, and still do an awful lot of Renaissance music. Um, it broadened out into Baroque music and the like. Um, but they've got a, an ongoing relationship with um, James Macmillan. And he wrote a, a stab at Marta for them fairly recently, in the last five years, I think, um, with strings and voices. And he's just an, a larger orchestral work in that they're involved with. But I think they also um, have a sort of like, a, I'm not sure that's quite a scholarship scheme, but mm -hmm. with working with young composers. Mm -hmm and um, getting them either by competition or seeing what they're like and keep having them as a, as a sort of a um, like a court composer mm. like a court, I can't think of the right word but just the one, but um, composer by appointment and they, these young composers write pieces for them mm. yeah I, I noticed that in the choral world there's more new works being commissioned in mm. the choral world yeah um, but not so much in the piano. Well, maybe I'm not looking hard enough. But. Well, I suppose um, if you're talking about piano with orchestra, I see why that. I mean, writing a piece for for choir, particularly for something like that kind of choir, is is relatively cheap. Right. Um, you know, um, you're not going to have to hire a big orchestra to do it. So writing, a, uh, and I suppose the effort involved in writing it. Is what um, if, if uh, a composer is invited to write a composition for the 16, mm -hmm. it could be three or four minutes long if they want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be just for four voices or as many voices as they're willing to divide into. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you write a piece, get a commission for a piano concerto. I suppose it could just be for piano and strings, but uh, if it's a big orchestra and wants piano concerto, 20 minutes, half an hour, it's a lot of music. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's, it's a bigger undertaking. Yes, we've we got to take the uh, the finance in mind. Mm, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, suppose, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be, you know, new new piano music. Uh, Solo piano music. Yeah, yeah. You know, cyclists going around. Um, yeah. But there are people who... Um, there's a, there's a, fin, a lady pianist uh, whose name just escapes me um, who commissions an awful lot of new music. Is it McGregor? Joanna McGregor at the Royal Academy. I was thinking right. Janet, so it probably is Joanna McGregor. Yeah. Right, right. I think she's very um, enthusiastic for that sort of thing. Yes. Um, you know, does a lot of good stuff with mm. modern music. And she's a great advocate of 
of modern music generally, not just you know recently written pieces. Yeah. When I was studying, I it wasn't said explicitly, but I sensed an atmosphere among the composers that if you were to revert to the old style of composing, say, you know, you're a contemporary person composing in the classical style, I got the sense that it was, you know, not advocated. You you shouldn't really do that. And I thought, but why not? You know, it's it's nice training to be able to replicate other styles, but you might not do it for professionally, but it's, I think it's good training, don't you think, to compose back in the old style and to see well, if you can um, I think... Um if you can write in an old style, um, it can certainly be a good learning process mm. for, for writing in your own style. Yeah. Um, does the world need another Rachmaninoff piano concerto? Probably the answer to that question is no. Why not? Uh, 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 <clears throat> but I, 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 I think there seems to be. Um, with some areas of composition, that if, it, if it's melodic mm. uh, and harmonic in the sense that it's not overtly dissonant, then, then it's no good. <laughs> um, it's just a way of finding um, a way of, of writing something that I think is melodic, harmonic, that is different, um, that, that a, with a bit of work, a, a modern audience can, <clears throat> can listen to and think, yes, I'm enjoying that. It's not quite doing um, what Rachmaninoff did, but it, but it does have it is a very clear melody. Um, I, I know you don't regard Prokofiev as, forget it, as not modern now, but I quite like Prokofiev's piano concertos, and in places they are dissonant, um, and it certainly doesn't sound like Rachmaninoff, um, but it, it, is, it is of its time, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's not overtly, you know, it's not an assault on the ears in any no. way. Um, and the, it seems to me that there must be a logical progression from that some way. Hmm. It's qu it's quite memorable, Prokofiev, yeah. even though it's quite distant and the intervals are quite, yes. um, I wouldn't say chaotic, but n unlike Rachmaninoff, it's still it's still quite memorable after oh, you hear yes. yeah, Prokofiev yeah, yeah. piece. Yes, um, <clears throat> I, I'm trying to I I listened to one of Michael T maybe his only Michael Tippett's piano concerto. Um, and I quite like that. That's it's not it's not as easy to listen to as Tippett as as, uh, as Prokofiev, but um, <clears throat> but I, I feel that I'm listening to a piece of music. Yeah. Um, I listened to some. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this guy's name. The Finnish composer, I think, Rautavara. Uh, Rautavara, whatever. Um, he is. Um, Again, it's, it's not unpleasant to listen to. Hmm. I, I, I'm guessing what, when you were talking about, when you introduced this subject, you were suggesting that uh, if, if it's not all crashy on the piano, it's not worth doing or something like that. I mean, the piano is an instrument that sings melodies to me, um, and, it, and it can be percussive. Uh, oh, there's nothing wrong with using it percussively. Hmm. Um, but if, if the whole thing is an assault of percussive noises, I, I could be doing without it. Yes. <laughs> but then I'm, I'm, I'm approaching ancient, so... <laughs> just, to, just to, you know, approach the end of the episode, um, what do you think of movie soundtracks? Do you like, do you like listen to movie soundtracks as well? <laughs> no, <laughs> movie soundtracks is... Is a it's a whole different thing. Of course, early early film composers generally tended to be composers rather than film composers. Uh, Vaughan Williams is um, 
wrote the music for, I think it was Scott of the Antarctic. Right. It was the Antarctic, not the Arctic, wasn't it? <laughs> in the wrong place. Uh, um, and uh, he, he, he turned the music that he wrote for that into, into a symphony afterwards. Um, William Walton wrote quite a lot of music. I know, I know it's, it's quite a different thing now. Um, and I'm aware of the speed these composers work. I mean, John Williams is John Williams had that fabulous gift of being able to come up with just a little idea that is so memorable. The one that all, that continually goes through my mind is, is the theme from Jurassic Park. Right, and uh, and it's it, it's so simple, but it's a great theme. It's also, the way he scores it. Um, uh, I think that um, it's interesting the way they're done, particularly now, uh, <coughs> you, the orchestrations that they use. The orchestrations, um, it often, they're played back not by orchestras, aren't they? I think they, they, the whole thing's synthesised sometimes. So things that wouldn't work with a real orchestra mm. will work, you know, because you can just turn the volume up if you want if you want the flute to play a low note and it to be heard, um, you know, against quite a lot of noise from elsewhere, you can still get it to come through. Um, but, um, yeah, just going back to um, John Williams, you know, his music stands without the film very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there are a lot of suites based on his Star Wars music and uh, various other things. That, what was the Schindler's List? Mm. Um, uh, he he seems to be able to sum up a mood uh, so easily and so succinctly. I mean, just two notes. If you is it Jaws, was it John Williams did Jaws? I think. Uh, oh, I think so. Well, if it yes. wasn't, whoever did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> did it with two notes, just a, a semitone apart. Yes, yes. Uh, you hear those two notes now, and you. Even now, I can think of Jaws if I hear those two notes in a different context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's a it's a skill, um, and an ab I know that um, when they they have to work incredibly quickly, and there's often one guy coming up with the music, but there's other people orchestrating it for them. Right, um, right. And borrowing, there's a lot of borrowing goes on. Mm. I do remember going to. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is answering your question. <laughs> I do remember going to see, I think, I think the film was Troy. Uh, it was, uh, and there was a long processional march. Oh, this is a great piece of music. And I think my son, I, I think it's a bit more familiar. I, I think I know this piece. And it was the, it was the Sanctus from Benjamin Britten's War Requiem to the note. It, it right. wasn't something that sounded vaguely like it. It was that piece of music with the voices off, no voices. Uh, uh, I won't mention the name of the composer, but he, he just lifted it. <laughs> 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 no, there's no question about it. He had right. <laughs> taken this thing. Oh, no. I don't know whether anybody was credited with Britain. I mean, Britain was dead, but <laughs> right. his estate knew about it. But still, I think it's a matter of respect, right? It's just to credit. Well, yes. Yeah. I mean, he may have done it. It may have been credited. Um, and I, I, film composers, now there are certain what you might call classical pieces that have influenced um, film composers, certain, certain ideas um, that you see cropping up everywhere. Mm. Um, the start of Mars from the planet suite is hinted at in a lot of science fiction films. Mm -hmm. um, the start of um, Daphne and Chloe by Ravel, there's a, there's a sunrise, and if you see sunrises on <coughs> in films, very often there'll be, a, there'll be a nod towards that. Not the actual, just the orchestration or, the, or some of the effects that he gets. Um, those, those wide open spaces that uh, Copeland uh, creates in his music, which makes it sound so American. Mm. Um, you, you get that kind of effect a lot if, if composers are wanting to 
to suggest a vast space. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Just going b- back to John Williams, um, I agree that he takes something so simple and can make it so fitting to the mood. Mm. I often think that, I might be wrong, but sometimes the wrong, in- like instruments can make or break a material. Mm. You know, sometimes the wrong instrument, you can have a great melody, but choosing the wrong instrument to play it at, at a particular context can ruin the whole thing. Do you reckon that's, how, how can composers, when they're composing music, what's the most, what's the best way to avoid wrong instrumentation? Or, or inefficient or un- an ineffective instrumentation? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I suppose certain instruments that, um, can do um, things. Um, this is a very poor answer. I'm floundering a little bit here. No, no, we can explore it together. Just yeah. let me think about it. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Are you, you suggesting that um, there are pieces of John Williams that you can listen to and, and you've thought that that, that that doesn't sound like the right instrument to me? No, no, no. Or are you just generally, you're asking the question? Generally, yeah. I mean, John Williams uses all the right instruments. I'm not saying he used the wrong instruments. I'm just oh. saying that I just, I, sometimes I imagine what if a different instrument was playing, you know, say, the Imperial March, Um Oh, okay. if, if if it wasn't those instruments, what would it sound like if it was different instruments? Would it ruin the mood? Would it? Well, not I I, I, now as I think about it, yeah, um, I can quote give an example. It's not a film music, uh, but uh, surprisingly, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. Right. You've got to bear with me a moment. Where <laughs> sure. I'm going with this. Sure. I heard a recording. Was on it. I think it was called Classical Rock, mm-hmm. and it was the London Symphony Orchestra or a London Orchestra and chorus doing Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, I used to use it as an example of orchestration, so I'm moderately familiar. I do know that in the original, I can't remember. You know, in the original Queen version. At one point, there's this guitar break, isn't there? Really, yes. Where the guitar goes mad, right? Okay. So this this arrangement sets off, and it, if you listen to the fit, you think this it seems like Debussy does this. Whoever whoever did the orchestration, right? Uh, and but it gets going, and when the the choir come in and do all that Beelzebub business, it's sensational. Now, when it goes through this guitar break, there's a there's a, a guitar comes in and, and takes over from the orchestra with a with a, a drum kit and all, and it sounds just right. It works really well. And somehow I lost that recording, and I I saw another orchestrated version of it, and in which in many ways was equally good. But when it got to this guitar break business, this guy had orchestrated it. There was no guitar in. And it was, I can't remember all of it, but it was, it was played on a piccolo with pizzicato strings. Right. And it just sounded absolutely awful. <laughs> it, well, I mean, it sounded comic. Right. Uh, you know, uh, it, complete mismanagement somehow. <laughs> So you've got a guitar and a drum kit and you replace it with pizzicato strings and a piccolo. Uh, <laughs> and, it, uh, and it ruined it. It mm. absolutely ruined it. Mm. Um, so, so there are some things that, that, it, that can be bizarre. Yes. Uh, I think there are other, other things where it could be one or the other. Uh, in, in, oh, I did a piece that, um, that I wrote that I mentioned earlier that was written to be performed with Handel. Um, another choir did it, and they did it in conjunction with the Mozart Requiem. The Mozart Requiem doesn't use oboes. Uh, and the conductor said, Could, would I be able to just transpose the clarinet part, uh, the oboe part for clarinet? Uh, and it really it didn't make much, well, it didn't make a bit of difference, it didn't sound quite the same, but uh, 
Sometimes it could be a, it, it doesn't change things, you know, it depends what you're wanting to, to create. If it's just a general, you just need something to play the melody at that point, uh, as I did, it didn't really matter whether it was a, an oboe or a clarinet. Uh, the oboe <clears throat> has a more plan plangent sound, I think, than the clarinet. So if you wanted to, I, I think of an example. Towards the end of um, Donizetti's Anna Bolena, just before she goes off to be executed, she sings an aria, and it's got an oboe melody, uh, obbligato going along with it. And the, the, it does sound very sad, it does an oboe, in that context, just with that. You could play it with a clarinet, and it'd be okay, but I do, it wouldn't just quite have have the, the same effect. So there are there are choices to be made, you know. Um, I, I was listening to something fairly recently and it was it was a string melody in a, in an orchestral piece. I can't remember the piece. And it was written in the viewer, it was written in the violin range. But it was played on viewer the, the composer written for viola. And it was sort of I would say in the treble clef, um, maybe up to a couple of notes above the top of the treble clef, so maybe up to A or B. And you'd think, oh, it's just going to be the same as a violin. A, a group of players, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't a solo player. But it wasn't. It was just that bit higher. It was just something about the, the size of the viola. It altered the whole effect mm. of it, made it I don't know richer is the word. Um, <clears throat> to me, I think a little more, a little more tense it made it to me. Mm. Uh, so yeah, there, sometimes I don't think it matters, uh, sure. but other other places it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's a make or break. Yeah. Yeah. The the one thing that comes to mind for me it's um, have you seen the Lolita movie by Adrian Lin? Um, the what? Uh, Lolita. No. The movie. So there was a soundtrack by. Um, Ennio Morricone. Oh, yes, I know. Um, he composed a piece for, um, I think it was the, near the ending of the film. It's called Love in the Morning. And at the beginning, there's you know, some very soft violins playing, playing a drone. And then, as you expect in the title, the morning, the mention of morning, um, Ennio Morricone used a flute in the middle register. Okay. So there's a very rich... Um, very rich, thick tone. And I just thought that was the most perfect instrumental use for that title and for the effect. It was, yeah, it was. Because when I think of morning, I think of the mist. And then all of a sudden, I think of flute at being the perfect, um, perfect instrument for that. And I think if it was maybe used by, you know, the clarinet or maybe another instrument, it wouldn't, it would work well, but it wouldn't work as well. Mm. as the middle register a very particular register yeah, yeah. and the instrument the flute so i think that was a, a another example i just want to give um to that question of you know some instruments do make or break a good melody yes i, I they probably do mm. um it's quite um i you you, you know the debussy prelude the girl with the flax and hair yes um it starts with a single note. Mm -hmm. doesn't it? If you were going to orchestrate that, I'd put you on the spot. <laughs> oh God! What what would you give that 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 melody to before all the harmony comes in? Mm. So if I remember correctly, it was a, it was a D flat, wasn't it? Yeah, I, know that I think there are a lot of flats around. Um, what would I what would I instrument that with? I'm not sure if it'd go high enough. I'll probably put that. Clarinet, or maybe an, an oboe. I'll probably go for an oboe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I there's um I can't remember if it's Colin or David Matthews. Both the brothers are both composers. One of them has orchestrated all the Debussy preludes, and I remember 
I would have gone with you if I'd have been orchestrated. I, I think, yeah, I think I'd have given a, a, an oboe bass right. clarinet. And I played the piano version to students at college and asked them the same question. And that's more or less what you got. Flute. Flute and octave I or Flute and clarinet in, op in octaves. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, during the orchestration of these various preludes, which was sensational, I guess, to find it astonishing, you, you could genuinely believe that Debussy had done them himself. That's the same world he gets. Um, but he, so he uses large orchestra, but for that particular piece, he just uses strings with a harp. And so it's a str it, I, I think it's violins at the start. Right. Uh, and he, he foregoes all the, 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 the obvious, but he, well, it's amazing. I can, I, can read, I can tell you it's amazing because it's the recording by the Halley Orchestra is very slow. Um, and I just thought like almost 30% longer than the, the, the piano. I don't maybe that's an exaggeration. But <coughs> when I played it to the students, <coughs> and bear in mind, no disrespect, <coughs> students, you know, unless something moves after 15 seconds, you know, <laughs> attention can go around it. Then <coughs> they're completely still for the whole of the piece, the whole of the piece. And when we finished, they wanted to listen to it again. So we listened to it twice. I think it took about five minutes each time. <clears throat> it's an unbelievable, and it, re it really, really works, despite the fact that like, you and them and myself, you thought it's going to be a woodwind yeah. or something like that. Ah, yeah. incredible. Yeah. So it's sometimes the unexpected that yes, can work yeah, even better. Yeah. So just a last question. Yeah. Um, this might be a bit easier. Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, reflecting back on your works that you've done, compose like composition works. Is there a work that you, a you know, style that you you want to compose that you haven't yet done so? A, like a um, maybe an orchestral piece or symphony that you haven't done, or a choir work, choral work that you haven't done that you wish to do. Um. Well, there are a number of pieces that I'd quite like to do. I did start um, a piece, and I just called it Mars. Okay. And, and I got about a minute and a half in, and I think I'm really arresting, certainly make people jump at the start. <laughs> it, it comes crashing in. Um, and sounds pretty good to me, um, but I, the bit that I've got, I just can't get beyond it. I, I want, um, I want, the, want to do something that um, I can't even explain to you <laughs> what I'm trying to, to uh, picture. But I do know I can't find the sound that I want to go on. Uh, and I had tried, I, I just left it, I, I'll come back to it maybe at some time. But um, I would, for the challenge, I think I'd quite like to write, try and write a string quartet. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> whether I ever do or not, I don't know. Choral works. Um, well, I've, I've just written this... Um, Credo that I mentioned. I think was, I think I finished that just a couple of years ago. Um, I quite like the idea of doing a set of vespers. Now, vespers is just a collection of psalms. Um, only because I, I, I quite like the words again, and we had. I went to a performance of, I can't remember the piece was, but it doesn't really matter now, uh, with the choir singing, and they had some dance. Um, just, it didn't have to be done with dance, it was somebody who put this idea, let's put a bit of dance to it. 
So there's this movement in front of me. And, and I thought that the title, I wouldn't call it just that, I thought of the title Dance Vespers. And if I use dance rhythms, there's no reason why you shouldn't, you know, people often said that Bach was influenced by dance, or the dance rhythms in his music. Uh, <coughs> whether as long as I kept them relatively short, it's trouble with psalms, something will be a bit long. Maybe I'll just do sections, I don't know. I quite like the idea of, of, of doing something like that, whether there could be some sort of movement going on, going on in front of it. Um, that might be quite interesting to do. Um, but other than that, I have nothing else particularly in mind at the moment. I'll just see what comes up, what somebody, somebody asks me to do something particular, you never know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I would tinker at little things like uh, something like get an idea to write a carol or, or a, a short anthem um, that, in terms of long, long, longer scale pieces, I, I need a bit of, to give a bit of a thought on those are the sort of things that the string quartet would be challenging. And this dance fest, was, if I ever get around to it, would also be quite challenging. I, I can't decide. I had two thoughts about that, or possibly three. One, I'd do it with piano, duet, and percussion. Okay, wow. Um, or or I'd, I'd do it with orchestra. Mm -hmm. Or <coughs> I'd do it for both. So you, you do two versions of the same thing. I don't know. Well, I'm, I, I really look forward to hearing those, if those ever come to... <laughs> if, 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 if I get around to Yes, that. yes. Uh, well, Ian, thank you so much. It's been quite enjoyable. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you. Yeah.